morning, everyone. Hi, Kyle. I'm Fuller. I mean, Elder here. Welcome to Christ Church. Happy Father's Day to those of you that celebrate Father's Day. And welcome to everyone who's joining us virtually. Are there any visitors here this morning? If there are. Could you please stand? Oh, all of us in our family were uh, Scott and Lisa Andrews, former residents and members of the church, and we're here today for the baptism of our grandchildren. My daughter Isabel, and Beatrice, <laughs> and Bodie, and Adam. We're so glad you're here today. Thank you. And um, well, they probably know about the business of the kids to come out. Two Sundays from now, on June 25th, we'll conduct our service in the garden. We'll also be conducting a blessing of the animals. So plan to bring your animal friends two Sundays from now. Um, actually, it's one actually, Sunday from now. Sunday. Next Sunday, June 25th. Okay. Are there any announcements before we begin the service? Kyle? Yes. If Roger doesn't want to, I'm going to say that it's Sandy Wickham's birthday today. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, we'll start. Bob's not here yet. Oh, no, oh there he is. Oh, there he is. Did I Bob, feel like you were a happy birthday, birthday for Sandy? It's like the angel of death back there. <laughs> <laughs> I try to start us on key, but we all know how that goes. That would be an unkindness to Sandy. Father and son, you know who they are. 
So this is Jesus, and this is Joseph. Okay? I love this picture too because look at the Jesus is hugging Joseph, and there seems to be a real you know, love and affection there. And Joseph is, has his hand over him like a hand of protection. And uh, it's really a lovely piece. But what are all these naked babies up here in the top? <laughs> are they clouds? Uh, baby clouds? They look like clouds, don't they? But look, one of them's like a grown up. But do you notice that they all have wings? Angels. They're angels, that's right. So why is this in the vision? Let me tell you the story. So God would talk to Joseph in his dreams, in his sleep. And then angels would come and whisper to Joseph and tell him things. And one of the things they told Joseph was that King Herod, who was a really bad and evil king, was trying to kill Jesus, was trying to kill the child. So he took Jesus and his mother Mary and took them into Egypt to hide them and waited for Herod to die to bring them back when it was safe again to bring them back. So... I think of Joseph in a lot of different ways, but I think one of the things he was, was he was courageous. He was brave. He was willing to defy the king, travel into Egypt, and then come back. And he was a courageous figure to me. And you know, it takes courage to be a parent. Whether you're a mother or a father, it takes courage to do that, to take care of their children, to help them learn and to grow and all those things. It takes a lot of courage to be uh, a mother or a father. And today's Father's Day. I hope you've had a chance maybe to say, hey, to your dad, and thank him. Our dad's in Arizona. Our dad's in Arizona, so we'll see him. Oh, okay. We'll see him later. Though. Well, thank him for all he's done and your mother, but thank him also for their courage because they have been courageous in bringing you guys up, okay? All right. So we're going to have a baptism, and if you, you guys are sitting right here, so you'll be able to watch it, and then after that, if you want to, we'll do a little thing called passing the peace, and I'll tell you about that. But then you can go downstairs for Sunday school if you want to, okay? All right, so have a seat. So let me invite the Mackenzies up. All right, me and Bodie. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> so Adam and uh, Isabel, Mackenzie. Uh, have requested that their children be in to be baptized. And uh, we also have with us the grandparents, Scott and Lisa, as you heard before. Um, but also present is their great-grandparents, uh, Ann and Bud uh, Andrews. So we have a great family gathering here. It's so great to see these old friends of ours. Um, so in the presence of God and in the, of this assembly, the folk of this church, uh, we will give thanks, first of all, to these beautiful children. Uh, they are precious among us, and we will baptize them today. So in the stories told by our spiritual ancestors, we hear of the Spirit of God moving over deep waters. And out of the waters of the deep, our ancestors imagine our Creator bringing forth the earth to sustain life and all life. And for the children of Israel, the waters of the Red Sea were a baptism of deliverance and freedom. Jesus was nurtured in the water by Mary's womb. The water of Mary's womb was baptized by John in the River Jordan and delivered living water to the Samaritan woman at the well. Jesus washed the feet of his disciples and sent them forth to declare good news. And by the gift of water, the earth has nourished and sustained us and all living things. By baptizing infants such as these, we acknowledge that before we know to seek God, God has sought us. It is God who initiates and sustains this relationship. So in response to the extravagant love of God, we follow the example of Christ's first disciples who used water to baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So, therefore, I invite you, Isabel and Adam, uh, to make the following declarations. Relying on God's abundant grace, He promised to live in the life and light offered to us in the example of Jesus and of all our spiritual ancestors. And do you now renounce those forces and influence that oppose God's goodness and love in our lives and in our world? And in seeking a deeper spiritual life, do you open yourself to the faith and compassion that Jesus and our spiritual ancestors demonstrated and accept the invitation to follow their example? And do you intend, as you are able and inspired, to continue this spiritual journey until the end of your life? 
And is it your desire to allow your children to be accompanied by the people of this congregation and of other spiritual communities to which you and they may belong? One more. <laughs> and do you promise to nurture Bodhi and Dee in their faith, attend them in their spiritual journey, and encourage them? Yeah, amen. That's an amen. And encourage them in their maturing in body, mind, and spirit. Yes. All right. Very good. <laughs>
and brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. I invite you to a minute of silent reflection.
school. So for the last six weeks, I've been teaching or preaching a uh, sermon series uh, on the Gospel of Mark. And uh, at the start of the series, I quoted New Testament scholar Marcus Bohr, and I want to do that again to provide uh, some uh, context. He writes, it is challenging to read Mark as the first gospel, as if the other gospels didn't exist. And this is our first encounter with the story of Jesus. It requires imagining that we haven't already. Um, it, it requires imagining that we haven't already heard about Jesus from the other gospels, from Christian preaching and teaching, and from what is taken for granted about Jesus in Christian and popular culture. Mark's story is striking because of what he does include and what he does not include. So the day is Father's Day, and uh, we read this morning the same passage, actually, that we read uh, on Mother's Day, uh, a description of the family of Jesus, uh, his mother and brothers and sister, without any mention of a husband or a father, known by Joseph or any other name. And through the years, this has been, um, there has been much speculation about the history and status of this fatherless family. One theory is that Joseph was a widower who had children from his previous marriage. And that is why in many pictures we find Joseph portrayed as an older uh, person, older man. So by the time this inquiry was made about Jesus, Joseph had died. That's the theory. And yet this is sheer speculation. There is no mention anywhere that Joseph was a widower or older. And if we are to take Mark at his face value uh, as our first encounter with the story of Jesus, then in his hometown he was known as the son of Mary and was part of a rather large family of siblings. And that is all we are told until Matthew, John, and Luke write some ten 20, and 40 years later. You know, I've preached a few times in the past on the topic of biblical marriage, and uh, in those sermons I've tried to dispel the notion that the Bible gives us the kind of traditional marriage and family assumed by some in our modern Western Christian world and culture. And people then are generally shocked to find that the Bible is full of stories about polygamy, forced marriage of captives, concubines, selling of daughters, prostitution, rape, and adultery. Maybe that's why some people are trying to ban it from the books of our, from the shelves of our libraries, right? <laughs> well, fatherhood does not always uh, fare so well in the Bible either. Abraham cast out his firstborn, Ishmael, and his mother, and they were forced to wander in the wilderness of Beersheba, where they almost perished. And he was all too willing to sacrifice his secondborn, Isaac, right? King David had 20 sons. And his third son, Absalom, mounted a rebellion against his aging father and was killed by the captain of David's army. And as with marriage, fatherhood in the Bible was not what some people imagine it to be. And yet our scripture does give us an example of good and I would even say ideal fatherhood. And it is Joseph. The story of Joseph is told first and most extensively in the Gospel of Matthew, uh, the second telling of the story of Jesus in our tradition. Um, some scholars believe that it is Matthew who develops the character of Joseph based on Joseph, the son of Jacob, whose story is told in Genesis. There are many similarities. Notable among them is they, they both were dreamers. God spoke to them in their dreams. Matthew portrayed Joseph as a righteous man, unwilling to expose his betrothed to public disgrace when he found that she was pregnant before they had consummated their union. It is in a dream that Joseph learned that this was the work of the Spirit, uh, one who would, or the fulfillment of the prophecies of a Savior, one who would demonstrate that God is with us. And when he awoke, he did as the Lord commanded him. And when the child was born, he named him Jesus. 
And when Herod sought to destroy the child by killing all the wee children around Bethlehem, again in a dream Joseph was warned. So he took the child and his mother by night and went to Egypt until it was safe again to return. And upon returning, and again guided in a dream, Joseph took them to make a home in Nazareth, a very small and out-of-the-way village where they would be safe, and he raised the child as his own. In Luke's nativity story, Joseph is also present. But Mary is really the main character of Luke's uh, narrative, with Joseph very much in a supporting role. And in the Gospel of John, where there is no nativity, um, John twice refers to Jesus as Jesus ben Joseph, Jesus the son of Joseph. Joseph in our tradition is an idealized and endearing example of fatherhood that is caring, engaged, and courageous. So in a recent article from Communio, which is a conservative Catholic organization and publication that supports traditional values in families, I read this. The flight of resident fatherhood from the home over the past 60 years may offer the best explanation for the collapse of Christianity in the United States over much of the last 40 years. Their recent study concluded that religious non-affiliation is <coughs> unlikely to stabilize until 25 or 30 years after married fatherhood stabilizes. This means evangelists interested in renewal or in revival must become effective in fostering healthy, Christ-centered marriages for a revival to take root. You know, it just strikes me that they seem not to realize that Jesus' own family, no matter how one interprets it, was in many ways not, was a non-traditional family. Perhaps the best explanation for Christianity, Christianity's dilemma or decline is the church's hoisting of their supposed traditional values upon us all. So last Sunday, a friend of mine, um, Having read an article about the Southern Baptist Convention, picking out churches who have women pastors on the basis of a verse from 1 Timothy, let a woman learn in silence and full submission. I permit no woman to teach or to have authority over a man. She is to be silent. And my friend asked me, is that in the Bible? I've never heard that before. And I had to explain to her, yes, it is in the Bible. But while it is attributed to Paul, Paul did not write it. 1 Timothy is not one of the original letters of Paul. 1 Timothy was written probably in the teens of the 2nd century. It was written when 2nd and 3rd generation Christians were struggling with issues of adaptation to Roman culture. Whereas Paul had been an egalitarian, truly, on questions of race, gender, and class. Remember his saying, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor and female, all are one in Christ Jesus. The church of the second century was more and more succumbing to the culture of the Roman household, where the father ruled over wife and children and slaves. Authoritarian bullies rarely make good fathers. Never really, but you know. <laughs> And yet there are, there are those in our church today who would call these passages, Colossians is in the same category, 1 Timothy and Colossians, which we read earlier, they would describe them as infallible scripture, forever binding on Christian behavior. And by the way, neither of these passages um, is included in our common lectionary. Uh, the prescribed readings for each Sunday, they are not included, so somebody... <laughs> is thinking about what we should and shouldn't hear, perhaps, in church. And there are parts of this book um, that should not be repeated, much less taught. There is much more, though, that can and will bless us, will become word of God to us in our hearing, which I believe is how inspiration actually works. It's not the letter on the page. It's the word in our hearts. 
So my father raised us in the ways of his time, his generation. He made a lot of mistakes, but he got a lot right <laughs> as well. I never doubted that my father loved us or was for us or that he would give his life for us. I raised my children in the ways of my own time, and I made a lot of mistakes as well. There is no on-the-job training program harder than being a parent. And I wish I had known what I do now when my children were under our care. All I can do now is love them and their children as best I can. And that's all we can ever do. My parents divorced my senior year of high school, uh, though they did remarry some years later. Uh, something I'm not sure my sister ever forgave them for. Uh, the remarrying part. <laughs> in that, in many ways, really, trust me, our family was not entirely a traditional family. There are no perfect fathers. It is the father who takes what he has and tries to do his best to love, protect, respect his children and to bring them up in ways that empower them rather than <coughs> diminish them. And you, know not, and you do not have to be just a biological father in order to do that. Many have fathered me who were not my father. So God bless our families. God bless our mothers, our children, and our fathers. No matter how our families might be defined, no matter the genders or orientations or self-identities beyond traditional interpretations, no matter if, it fit, if it's a family of two or four or twenty, no matter if the bonds are biological or simply chosen, God bless our families and God bless our fathers. Maryland's and, and Sally Russell. Tuesday will be a year since I Stu left, so it just doesn't seem possible, but 
I'll take some hugs too. <laughs> I do have one to add. It's just that uh, prayers for remembrance. As many commemorate Juneteenth this uh, week, prayer that this important aspect of our history not be forgotten or banned. So let us pray. <clears throat> Loving and gracious God, we acknowledge your presence with us this morning and every morning. We are grateful for your love, never really plumbing its depth or understanding it fully but desiring to hold it fast in all the seasons of life. We are awed by your love, especially when we find it difficult to love ourselves or to love one another. But you love us in our suffering, in our rejoicing, even in our questioning, in our confusion. As a parent's embrace calms a frightened heart, so your love reaches out and brings us peace. And so we also are encouraged to reach out to one another. We ask that more and more our world may come to know your healing love, that your love may touch all the corners of the earth, people and creatures that we do not know, but whose lives are precious to you. And we pray for those whose lives we know so well, parents and children, spouses and friends, this beautiful valley and all who dwell here, fill them with your love. And we pray for ourselves, when we are afraid, calm our hearts and give us courage to the task that you are calling us to, to the life that you are inviting us to. Our Father, our Mother, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Thank you. 
Oh, sorry, the closing hymn, which is hymn 354, Guide My Feet. Thank you. 